All right, here we are. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've been asked, well, I've been asked, but uh, some pressure from some, but not really. It feels like uh, pressure. It's kind of unnerving uh, standing in front of a camera. But we're going to do a study on the book of Revelation, a uh, book that uh, seems so many people are interested in and want to get into that and look through it and know what's going on. We have a um, quite a, an interest in the things of the future and that, but the book of Revelation is not all about the future. It's uh, some uh, past, some present, and mostly future. My name is Pastor Paul, and uh, this may be a long series of videos, or it may not. I'm not sure. We're not going to get in too deep, but uh, there's a lot to cover. Last time we did this in church, we've gone through Revelation a couple times, and sometimes it takes up to a year to get through it, but I don't think we're going to take that long. But um, we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And what that means is uh, we're not going to listen to uh, ourselves or our opinions on what the things mean. Okay, we're going to uh, uh, look into the Scriptures and uh, let the Scripture speak for, it, speak for itself. I think that's fair, don't you? And that's the safe way to do it. That's the best way to do that. Uh, many people are wondering what's going on in our climate today and what's taking place. Is this the end or whatever? Well, let's have a look at the book of Revelation, see what it says. And we're going to go bit by bit. We're going to break it down and show you some of the uh, main components of it. And once we get an idea of the um, each set of things that's taking place and such, uh, it'll begin to uh, uh, come together and you'll see it very clearly. First of all, we have to do an introduction before we even get into the first chapter, which is a kind of an introductory piece itself. But um, um, make sure you take some notes because uh, we might be going fairly quick over some things. And you want to uh, take notes for the purpose of writing things down and uh, so you can check it out later. You can go back in the Bible. Now that, that's a good thing too because uh, the Bible says that the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Okay, you don't just take what a book says, what some man says, or whatever. Uh, get into the scripture because we're looking at the Word of God, right? Uh, we want to make sure that is um, the thing here before us, that we uh, honor the Lord and uh, the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We want to honor them by taking heed to the um, uh, the Word of God. Now you must have it 100% sure in your mind that uh, uh, the Bible is the Word of God, okay? You've got to be convinced of that, all right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We want to look back and consider something first of all when we get going in this. We want to look at um, some Old Testament prophecies. Now, um, and for time's sake, I'll, I'll maybe just mention some of these things, and you can check it out yourself later. Um, I won't get into it too deeply, but in the, um, um, in the Psalms, we have some interesting things taking place here. Now, some of the Psalms were, uh, David didn't write all the Psalms, but uh, quite a few of them. Uh, this uh, Psalm 22 is a Psalm of David. Now, I just want you to listen to a couple of the things that are going on here. It says, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Where have you heard that before? Okay, that was some of the things that the Lord Jesus said when he was on the cross of Calvary. Okay, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I want you to note this, that this is the Psalms, David writing or penning this roughly a thousand years before Jesus would go to the cross. Now, how could that be? How could that be that somebody could pen those very words that Jesus would say on the cross or know that that was going to be said? We say, well, Jesus just read that and repeated it. Oh, is that right? Well, let's go a little further. He says, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And it goes on and on. Uh, uh, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Uh, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. Okay? The soldiers did that at the cross of Calvary, didn't they? Now, uh, the soldiers didn't read that and say, let's go and do that, because that's what it says way back then. No, 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 no. This is a prophecy a thousand years before those things took place. Now, this is very important for us to see this. And it goes on to, um, to say some other things. This is Psalm 22. Um, another great portion of Scripture we could look at would be uh, Isaiah 53. Now, in Isaiah 53, you're looking at approximately 700, 720, 750 years before the Lord Jesus uh, went to the cross of Calvary. But some of the things, and you probably know Isaiah 53, you probably know some of those things off by heart. Um, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes are we healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, uh, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Therefore will I divide he may portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Another portion talks about him, his uh, hands and his feet being pierced. And, and on it goes. I've been told, I haven't checked it out myself, so you can check it out. I've been told, I forget it was a between two and three hundred different prophecies concerning the, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and his uh, going to the cross and his return and all these things. I heard an interesting thing. We used to have our children in, in uh, Awana Club. Some of you probably know about that. Um, there was a, um, a thing about prophecy in there, just an illustration that said, uh, talking about the odds. Now, what were the odds of, say, Isaiah? Uh, penning those things and then they just be coming true down the road like that 750 years later. What are the odds of David penning those things and a thousand years later those very words would be spoken? Now the odds are this, and this really puts it, uh, brings it home to me uh, and I hope to you too. Uh, if you would take the state of Texas, now they say Texas is pretty big and I guess it is, and you take the state of Texas and you cover it in silver dollars to the, a depth of two feet, okay? And picture that in your mind. The state of Texas is covered with silver, silver dollars to a depth of about two feet. One of those silver dollars is painted red on both sides. Okay? Okay? And picture that. Now, just one of them in the whole state of Texas, two feet deep in silver dollars. Now, you fly over top of the state of Texas and you parachute out and you land on the ground, bend over and pick up. There's that red one. You know what the odds of that are? The odds of that happening are the same odds as one of these prophecies taking place, and yet there was two to three hundred of them. We're dealing with the Word of God, and the prophecies here are true because God gave it. Just some little illustrations and some things for us to consider what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with. The Bible is the Word of God, and you must be 100% convinced of that. Okay? And this is the authority that we have. And our opinions don't matter. We bring them to this. It's the Word of God. We're studying God's Word, not our opinions and our words. First and foremost, we go any further. Are you saved? You realize that you're a sinner before God. God said so. There's none righteous. No, not one. What about your sins? What are you going to do about that? God says we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why it was prophesied of him back in the, uh, Isaiah 53. 
to go to the cross to pay the price of our sins. He died on the cross and rose from the dead on the third day. That whoever would trust in Jesus Christ, take him as Savior, believe with all of your heart, not just your head, okay? You'll miss heaven. It's just head knowledge. Oh, I know something about Jesus. No, you know him as your Savior. He went to the cross for you, individually, personally, okay? We turn from our sins and we look to the Savior and say, Jesus, forgive me. Save my soul, however you want to put it, but from your heart, okay? Very, very important. Now, when we get to looking at some of these things in the book of Revelation, um, there's basically, I guess, there may be more ways to look at it, but uh, we're going to just uh, consider uh, some of the ways that people look at the book of Revelation here, just in case you run across that a little uh, further down the road and it, it might be confusing. Before we get going into the actual uh, book itself, there are basically four major views to uh, how to look at or what the book of Revelation is about. Um, there's a, uh, what they call the Praetorist, I don't know if I pronounced that properly or not, but whatever, um, means that uh, some people believe that all the things in Revelation have already been fulfilled. Granted, there are a few things in there that refer back to uh, some uh, uh, earlier uh, times. Uh, like I said, it talks about the book of Revelation itself, talks about the things that, uh, that were, that are, and shall be. So we see a past, present, and future. So we have that. But if we take that view, the Praetorist view, that the things have already been fulfilled, Okay. And some uh, are, uh, they take a, a, a his, historist, uh, they say it's all history, and the events from the uh, ap apostolic age right up to the end of the end of time are found in, in there. Um, then there's the idealists that take the, the book on, uh, um, they say, well, it's basically uh, setting forth uh, spiritual realities, okay? And then there's a futurist view which says and believes that the major part of the book is still future. Okay? The, um, the idealist theory, uh, if, the, if, the, uh, if the book of Revelation uh, is just uh, spiritualizing all the events, well, anybody can say whatever they like then. There's no real uh, authority to it. Okay? This would be just absolute confusion. They would just give a spiritual explanation for it. So we, just, we rule that out uh, entirely. And the Praetorist view, uh, granted some things we have, like I said, in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 do indicate 70 AD. And, uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, we pretty much reject that view with things already being fulfilled. Let me ask you a question. If you went to the book of Revelation and worked backwards, if it's all been fulfilled, do you tell me when Jesus Christ came to back to this earth? And when did these things, these uh, plagues, when did the wrath of God, when was it poured out upon the earth? Because it hasn't, okay? So we can just dismiss that one as, as well. We can't take that as uh, anything that's uh, going to give us, uh, um, um, going to give us any uh, understanding. But we take basically the futurist view. Okay, as much of it is future yet. We have to rightly divide the word of truth. We have to put things in their place, comparing uh, scripture with uh, scripture. And that's a good idea, and that's a good thing to do. The Bible wants us to be able to uh, take those things and put them uh, all together. We come to chapter one in the book of Revelation. Now chapter one itself is, I said it was an introduction, but it's not really, an, I guess you could say that, but. Uh, just for, that's the way I look at it, is to get it started, but it introduces the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is nothing, it's nothing, uh, uh, it's not something to be dismissed. It's something, every bit is important. Every word of God is important. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, we're not going to look at each and every word as we go through here. We're going to try and get some of the main things here. We look at the Revelation. Um, chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I don't have my notes in front of me for this. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but we'll just start and get a few things on the go here. This is our introduction anyways. Uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that word revelation is an interesting word for us. It simply means the uncovering or the revealing of. 
And it has the idea of something being uncovered quite quickly. If you were to go over to, uh, say you had curtains on your window and you went over and you just quickly threw the curtains back and then you would reveal and you would see and the sunlight would come through and such. And there we have the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ and the things of him. In chapter 1, we're going to see some things about Jesus Christ that are very important for us, things he did for us, things that he, uh, uh, what he is personally, even his appearance is here in chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Now note, um, you, when you read your Bible, read it through fairly slowly. You can read it through quickly and cover ground and that, but you're going to really catch things when you go a little bit slower and just look at the words. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. The Father gave this to and for uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to show unto his servants. Now, that's interesting. You see, it comes down like this, eh? comes down what? That's not a right way to put it because Jesus Christ is not lower than the Father, but coming to us, coming down to us. The Lord wants us to know and understand what's taken place and what these things are about. A lot of times the book of Revelation is misunderstood. Um, uh, there's a lot of folks that don't even study it, don't even approach it. They don't understand it. It's not that hard to understand. There's a few uh, key things to look for and to look at. We're going to look at it as chronologically. But uh, the Lord wants us to understand things to show unto his servants, which must shortly come to pass. And it doesn't necessarily mean shortly as, and see, some would take that as way back in the first century, <clears throat> excuse me, in the first century when this was penned, when the Spirit of God moved upon John and he wrote these things down, um, it doesn't mean that it would happen just quickly and shortly right there. It meant more like it quickly. When things start to come uh, about in these things, it's going to happen quickly. One thing we'll notice too, we can see, and to keep in mind and consider, would it be possible for God to delay certain things uh, put them off for a time? I'm sure. We have to keep that in mind that uh, God doesn't use our calendar or our timetable. God has a plan and things will come, up, come around when he says so. That's his mercy and his grace. What if the Lord had brought these things to pass back, say, in the first century, in the Bible times back there, as we call them? Well, you and I wouldn't be here. Okay. Simply God's grace and his mercy... And he puts that off. And we'll see that as we go through the book of Revelation. We're going to see the mercy of God come out in, uh, uh, in tremendous ways. Oft times when people see Revelation, they think of the terrible and horrible things that are going to come upon this world. And they will. And they will come upon this world. Terrible and horrible things. There's going to be a day when the fa Father says and God says, Look at enough's enough. I have to judge the earth for its sin." And so on. But we'll note something, one of the interesting things we went through last time, we picked out the mercy of God, and in the, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but just to, uh, as we talk about the mercy of God, um, in, the, in the trumpets and such, you'll find that there are uh, the wrath of God coming forth, but it talks about one third of this, and one third of this is afflicted, and one third of this. That's the mercy of God. It's just one third. It's not until later on in the last bit where he pulls out all the stops and then there's no more mercy as it were. And it's just a fascinating, fascinating book. But you see, the, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, God wants us to know things. Remember the Lord Jesus upbraided the Pharisees at one point in the Gospels there. He said to them that you can discern the face of the sky for when you see the... Uh, um, when the sky is red and lowering and you will know it's going to be a good day. You know, we, we say red sky at night, sailor's delight for the next day. And that comes from the Bible. He says you can discern the face of the sky but not the signs of the times. That's not exact words but uh, just uh, my paraphrase so to speak. If that's the word. Um, he upbraided the Pharisees for not understanding who was standing there talking to him, to, the, to them rather. They could, look at the, they could look at the sky and see what kind of a day we're going to have tomorrow. But they had God manifest in the flesh standing before them and they didn't get it. Well, if they did, they hid it pretty well or just in their hatred and such. But we won't get into that right now. 
when the Lord Jesus said, look it, you should be able to understand the things that are taking place. We look at our current events around about us and God wants us to know. You say, well, are the current things taking place? Are these the things from the book of Revelation? Well, why don't we look at the book of Revelation and see? We don't have to suppose this or suppose that, but God wants us to know things. And if you are to learn things about God, if you are to learn from Him, you have to read your Bible and study it. I hope you have a uh, daily uh, devotion time, as we call it, where you study the Word of God and you pray. When we pray, we're talking to the Lord, and when we read our Bibles, He speaks to us. The Spirit of God will use Scripture. He won't talk to you from the wind or some squirrel in a tree or whatever. It's not going to happen. He speaks to us from His Word. It's complete. It's full. And we have it in our hands. And He wants us to know the things that He's doing. And we can see that. And we can understand things which must shortly come to pass. And He sent and signified it by His angel unto His servant John. Now, isn't that an amazing thing? He went from, the, from God uh, gives it uh, to the Lord Jesus and gives it, passes it on and an angel takes it to John. And from John... John penned this thing under the supervision of the Holy Spirit, I put, it, I put it that way, and it's written down, we have it here today in our language, and it's come down to us, to me, and to you. There it is, we have this Word of God. A fascinating, fascinating thing that's been uh, um, passed down to us. Tons of verses for us to look up, uh, go along with those things, but we're not going to right now, just for time's sake. And he bear, oh, I'm sorry, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things. Did you get that? Keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Okay. Blessed is he that reads and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Okay, we were talking about prophecy earlier, the Old Testament prophecies, and how important they are, how they validate the Word of God, and validate God as if He needs it. Not really, does He? But sometimes people don't understand and will not accept. You understand, when you pick that Bible up, you're dealing with something holy. You're dealing with something eternal. It's the words of the living God in our language here today. Okay? And there's a blessing for simply reading the thing. Especially when we're talking about the book of Revelation. There's a blessing for reading through this. It's not that difficult, as you'll see as we get going through it. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Not just in reading. So somebody's to read it out loud to others. Is that the idea? Yeah, God doesn't want his word hid. The Lord wants his word to be spread, to get it out there to people. That's what can change lives. That's the only thing that can rescue people. That can, the only thing that can deliver people from their sins is the Word of God, faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Get it out there. If you want to have a look and continue on, we started on, or we left off, um, in uh, Revelation um, chapter 1, verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now we're going to just continue on there. Um, we saw that in the first uh, few verses that uh, the book of Revelation being given, uh, the revelation of Christ, the unveiling, the showing of who he is. And in this chapter we see exactly who he is. In case anybody had any doubt, I mean there's not really any doubt uh, uh, if you look at the Bible and study it honestly. You're going to see this is God manifest in the flesh, and now you're going to get a glimpse of Him in this glorified body that He has, in this glorified position that uh, He's in. This, uh, as the Lord Jesus would be seen in heaven, I suppose. Um, there's a blessing here for those that uh, read uh, this prophecy. We looked at prophecy earlier uh, to see how important prophecy is to uh, show us and. Uh, to help us to understand when God says something, that's it, because it's God's Word, and the Bible is God's Word. But those that read, those that hear, and those that keep these things, there's blessings for that. Now, this is the seven churches in uh, uh, Asia he's going to be writing to, first of all, after chapter 1. This is the uh, uh, 
uh, introduction into that, but uh, I, I use that word as probably not the best word to to use. It may not be a, a proper word introduction that kind of makes it think that it's not as important the other, but just the first section of it, because if we are in, it'll be in sections. Uh, chapter one's a section, chapters two and three's a separate section, chapter four and five is its own section, and so on and so forth. But here we are, um, John to the seven churches in Asia. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that's Asia Minor. That would be, and today if you look on a map, I believe uh, Turkey is in that area, be the west side over there, um, just above the very eastern side of the Mediterranean, the west side of Turkey, of course. Um, why Asia? Why these seven churches? Sometimes people say, well, why, um, why did the Lord pick these ones out? And I can't really say for sure, although there's a verse here for us to look at. And I'll just give you the, uh, the address here. We'll just touch on it a bit. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul was, this is his second arrest in 2 Timothy. He wrote this when he was in Mamertine Dungeon. This was the, the, the last uh, epistle that he wrote, that the Lord had him uh, copy down. Um, he was going to be beheaded shortly after this in Mamertine Dungeon, a horrible, terrible place, kind of like death row, so to speak. There's an interesting uh, verse here that will give us some light as to why the seven, at least I think why, why the seven uh, churches are, are picked out here. Anyways, let's have a look. As we see this... Um, the Apostle Paul, uh, verse, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Now that's not, not you know, China and such like that. As I said, this is, this is the, uh, um, the east area of what we would call Turkey today in that area there. There was churches up in there that were started. And when the Apostle was arrested the second time, um, nobody came to his uh, uh, defense. There was nobody with him, okay, or very few, none, none from this area anyways, which is a sad commentary on those particular churches uh, at the very least. But let's have a look at the verse. Uh, All which are in Asia are turned away from me. They turned away from him and left him. I just wonder if perhaps, and this is just my thinking, Perhaps uh, this is something where the Lord says, well, I'm going to address that situation, and here he is going to be addressing it here, and using those seven churches as examples for us to look at, and we can examine ourselves in our own churches and such, and see where we're at, and see if these things fit for us, and so on. And uh, so let's have a look a little further here. So we see that the seven churches in Asia... And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, here's another one. You're going to find a lot of uh, uh, symbolism in the book of Revelation. And you're going to find a lot of things where sometimes we have to say, I don't know. Okay, And that's probably the safest thing to say rather than just saying, well, it makes something up. Uh, but if we find some Bible verses that will go along with this, well, that might give us some uh, uh, idea of what's taking place here. And I'm going to give you a couple verses and you can, another study for you at another time, a little later on, okay? Now, this seven spirits, the seven spirits uh, which are before his throne, we see that here in uh, chapter 1, verse 4, and also over in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He that hath the seven spirits of God. Do you catch that? And uh, over in chapter 4, verse 5, we read, um, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And over in chapter 5, verse 6, we see this mentioned again. And we read, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. It's talking of the lamb that had been slain. This is Jesus Christ. This is showing him standing before the throne and uh, with these seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. There's also an Old Testament uh, um, uh, 
uh, verse for us to consider when we look at these things. It seems to have something to do with the Lord Jesus and with the Spirit of God and with His uh, uh, watching and walking through the earth and so on and so forth. Um, Zechariah 4, 410. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'll just read it. But Zechariah 4, 10. It says, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. There's those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. You put it all together, we see the Lord is seeing, he sees, um, he, nothing gets past him. It has to do with Jesus Christ. It has to do with the lampstands. It has to do with the churches and all the stuff. You put it together. It's a very difficult thing to explain, but there's some verses for us to look at and just to ponder those. Uh, we're going to go on from that. Suffice to say, there's a lot of things about God that we just don't know. We're looking at God being an, He is an infinite being. And there's no end to him. Uh, there's no beginning, there's no end. And we have a, a finite mind, and we're trying to look at infinite things with our finite minds. Sometimes you say, well, maybe I just don't know about that. As far as the seven spirits before the throne of God, there's a few verses to look at and ponder. Check it out and see what you come up with. Um, verse 5 and from Jesus Christ. You notice there was three here. Uh, he that uh, um, sorry I lost my place. And um, From him which is and which was and which is to come. There's one. And from the seven spirits before the throne two. And from Jesus Christ that's three. Where do you find those three in the Bible? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you see the seven um, uh, eyes before the throne of God may have to do with the uh, Holy Spirit, okay? And the things of, of, of himself and so on and so forth. So we put those together. And Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, okay? The faithful witness. Now, we didn't know the Lord Jesus was certainly faithful to the task. We have him in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before the crucifixion. In the Lord Jesus, they say, the Bible tells us he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Now, he didn't sweat drops of blood. It was as it was, like as it were. Uh, but it was a difficult time because he knew what was coming up and such. But uh, the Bible says that he is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. I personally don't believe that Jesus was um, uh, sweating and concerned over the... Uh, that's not the word concerned that he was saying. He says, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. The Lord Jesus wasn't going to say that because he's the lamb that was slain before, from before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's something else <clears throat> that took place at the cross. Uh, yes, he was paying for our sins and he would be crucified and the horrible, horrible things. But also you see the Father would basically turn away from him and leave him on the cross and the wrath of God be upon him. Um, I personally believe that it was the, the, the thing the Lord Jesus in Gethsemane, the thing that he was so um, uh, upset about, that's not the right word either, but you know what I mean, uh, was that he would have a fellowship with the Father broken for a time there, if you could say it that way. Some may disagree with that, but I can't help that. Um, but him being the Father turning away and, and all that. Uh, but then the Lord Jesus says, nevertheless, uh, uh, thy will be done. So we see, but being the faithful witness, he didn't uh, turn away from what was before him. And aren't you glad for that? Sometimes the Lord has things for us to do, and well, we might make excuse, we might put it off, procrastinate. The Lord Jesus didn't do any of that. He had a thing to do. Why? Well, Hebrews tells us, for the joy that was set before him, the, jo the joy of the cross, the joy of what was taking place at that cross and Jesus Christ there and he was faithful to the end in all of it and faithful to the whole charge that was given to him that he did and dying for the sins of the world. And the joy, I like to think of, he could see being God himself, 
God manifest in the flesh. He understood and knew and knows every person that will come to him through Jesus Christ and be saved. And that's a great and wonderful joy. If you're saved, if you're born again, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you've taken Jesus Christ as your Savior, <clears throat> you are a great joy to God. In fact, when you got saved, it says the angels in heaven were rejoicing. What an amazing thing, isn't it? The first begotten from the dead, it says there. First begotten from the dead. See, well, there were others that were raised. Lazarus was raised. And there was a, some of the graves were opened uh, when Jesus died on the cross and some of the saints came out of the, their graves and such. Yeah, but they came back with the same body. Jesus Christ is the first and only one that has ever yet uh, been resurrected with a different body now, a spiritual body, one that is not impeded by walls and such. As we can see, he just appeared to the disciples in the upper room. He's just there. He's just different. The glorified body, we call it. He's the uh, first fruits. He's the first one of the harvest. And when Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds, one of these days you're going to hear the, 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 the trumpet will sound and the voice of the archangel and Jesus will call all the believers up and those which are dead and have died in Christ, their bodies will be changed and brought up and, and meet them. We which are alive and remain shall uh, go up and meet the Lord in the air and have forever be with the Lord. Just a wonderful, amazing thing. But he's the first begotten. As he is, so, so shall we be in that sense that our bodies will, have, uh, will be changed. The prince of the kings of the earth. And he's called the prince of the kings of the earth. <clears throat> now, that's an interesting thing because we're looking, some people are looking towards, uh, we look at the end times and such, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be a guy who we call the Antichrist. He will be a ruler over the earth. There'll be a, a one world government, kind of a communistic system, a one world government, and they'll have this one leader over top of it all. He will be the ruler over the earth at that time. But there's somebody who's far above all that. Jesus Christ is uh, the prince of the kings of the earth. Now that word prince right there has the idea of ruler. He's the top one over all. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And remember, the devil's a copycat. And the Antichrist, when he comes upon the scene, he's going to try and make people uh, think that he's the Messiah. But he's a false one, isn't he? Bringing in a false peace and all that. But we'll get to that later. We'll see a lot of that later on and halfway through this. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Prince of the Kings of the Earth. Now, it's an interesting few things here um, in verse 5. It says, uh, uh, unto him, that's to Jesus, that loved us. Now, there's three important things mentioned here and uh, three wonderful things for us. It says, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Verse 5 and 6 there. Note these three things. First of all, he loved us. It says right there, I don't know if you can see that Bible verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, you can put your name in there. Every person, uh, whether you're saved or unsaved, the unsaved, God loves you too. Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross of Calvary. He's your Savior if you'll take him. If not, I'm sorry, the Bible says you're going to go to hell. You're going to wait the judgment. And that sounds harsh, but that's just what it is. That's just what it says. That's just boiled down in a nutshell. There it is. Jesus came to save us, to deliver us from our sins, to deliver us from hell, to bring us to heaven, to bring us into eternal joy and such with him. But he loves us. <clears throat> he loved us enough to go to the cross, but he not only did it, it didn't stop there. He still loves, and today he continues, continues to love us, his people, and love those, and he wants to draw uh, the unsaved to him, that they would turn to Christ and be saved. But if you can't remember anything out of all this stuff that we go through today, you remember that one thing, that God loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. We sing um, uh, for the children 
in church on Sunday morning is the first verse, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. It's true, folks. One of the things that this old world needs is for people to be loved. There's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of strife. But God, who is love, loved us. And it says he washed us from our sins. Washed us, cleansed us. You can't go into the presence of God with your sins. <clears throat> I use the uh, illustration often. We have four sons. And when they were little, they'd go outside, they'd play. And as little boys would do, they would get... Uh, Sometimes get kind of kind of muddy and dirty and stuff, you know, the boots and the pants, and they'd be, and they'd come to the door, and they'd be stopped right there. You can't come in here like that. You've got to get cleaned up, boys. Come on now. You can't go into the presence of God with your sin. You've got to get cleaned up. And Jesus did that. All you've got to do is accept, believe, put your faith in Him, trust in Him with all your heart. But He washed us from uh, from. Uh, our sins in his own blood, it says right there in verse 5. The blood of Christ is so precious. Acts chapter 20, you check it out. I uh, forget the verse, is it 28? Uh, I don't remember. It, it talks about the blood of Christ being the blood of God. Okay? Very important. He loved us, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. <clears throat> and then we have this bit here in verse 6 and he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Kings. Over in chapter 20 of Revelation, the last part of verse 4, it talks about the, the saints will uh, live and uh, reign with Christ a thousand years as kings. So we take those three things, we see that he loved us, he loosed us from our sins, and he lifted us up into a very high position. What a great Savior we have. And this is all about Jesus Christ. This is the revealing of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Christ, isn't it? Let's continue on there. I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, like I said, you need to write down the uh, as much as you can, or uh, different verses and such, and check it out later. And in verse 7, it says, uh, Behold, he cometh with clouds. There's this, one of the hymns that we sing on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise. Well, that's, that's not right. Jesus is going to come back in the clouds. I'm not looking for a cloudless morning. It's going to be clouds. He's coming back in the clouds, it says. He's going to be there. That's what it says. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And let's look at this now for a minute. And every eye shall see him. Now, when the Lord Jesus comes back, you could say it's in two stages. I don't may not be the right way to say it, but that's the way I'm going to use it today. Um, first of all, he comes in the clouds, okay? He does not come immediately down to the earth, okay? That's later on. But he comes with, uh, he comes in the clouds, and look what it says there in verse 6. Um, I'm sorry, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every person on the earth shall see him. Uh, they're going to, everyone's going to have a chance to see and recognize Look at this. There he is. And they which, I'm sorry, uh, and they also which pierced him. They which pierced him. Now, we have a verse in the Bible for us just to consider here in regards to they which pierced him. In the book of Acts, I just use a little Bible here to get through and find the, find the verse. Acts chapter 4 and down to verse 26, it says this, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So you see all that were involved. Who was involved with putting Christ on the cross? Everybody. Everybody was involved, but particularly the Jewish people. They're mentioned in there as well, uh, of course. And they will see him too. But look what it says. And, uh, they all, and they shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth. All this, it means all the different tribes, all the different nations, all the different peoples of the earth will wail because of him. 
I think that some will wail because the, the place that they will find themselves in at that time, maybe recognizing that uh, who Jesus Christ is, the Bible does talk about that, that, uh, that many will uh, turn away in, in anger from him and they will kind of shake the fist at God. And they'll be very angry, be wailing in tears over him when he's there. But nonetheless, he's coming back. He's coming back. And uh, it says at the end of verse 7, Even so, amen. And we read that amen. It simply means, may it be so, or let it be done, something like that. Okay. Now verse 8. Now, some argue about the deity of Christ, and I don't know how they can do that if they seriously read the Bible, but you know and understand that the Bible is not understood except the Spirit of God would guide you. Okay, It's spiritually discerned. An unsaved person can't necessarily understand these things and put these things together. But they should understand and see as the Spirit of God would come upon them and show them that Christ is the Savior. But look what it says in verse 8, a description of the Lord Jesus. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. The Alpha and the Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Our New Testament it was uh, penned in the, basically in the Greek uh, uh, from that time. Verse 8, chapter 1, Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Now look at the last two words, the Almighty, okay? The Almighty. This is the Lord, the Almighty. This is Him. This is the description of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this is the revelation of Christ, the uncovering, the showing of who He is, okay? It goes on to say in verse 9, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation. John, You'll notice that these fellows from the first, uh, what we call the Bible times, the first century, whether it was John or Paul or Peter, whoever it was, they didn't have these big titles in front of their names. They weren't the most holy reverend doctor, whatever. Just look at them, just a man, just a servant of Jesus Christ. And that's very important. And uh, a brother, a servant, and companion, he says, and uh, in the kingdom, now, there's a couple different aspects to the kingdom that we consider. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in the clouds, and when he finally does come down to this earth, he will set up his earthly kingdom. But right now, today, um, as he said earlier, uh, or in the Gospels, he said that the kingdom of God comes not with observation, and the kingdom is within you. That uh, in, let me get the verse here, in Colossians chapter 1, you can check that out sometime. Um, Colossians chapter 1, I think it's verse 13. It says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, that means the authority of darkness, and hath translated or removed us from one place into another. But look what it says. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. When you get saved, when you trust in Jesus as your Savior, you are removed from the authority, from the power of darkness, and transferred, translated into the kingdom of his dear Son. There's the spiritual aspect of the kingdom right now within us. We are citizens of heaven. It's present. It's right now. But what a wonderful thing it is when an unsaved person is under the authority and the power of darkness. And when you were unsaved, you were in that place. But when you got saved, you're removed from that. You were bought with the blood of Christ and you were placed into the kingdom of Christ and the Spirit of God came and lived right inside of you and there he is where he's going to stay. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. What a wonderful, tremendous blessing that is to us to know where we are and how we're looked after. The kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Now he goes on to say he was in the isle called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ. Now a lot of people say that John was on Patmos. He was there um, for uh, that he had been preaching the gospel and such and he was sent there in exile like a, like a prison sentence. Like it was a prison colony kind of thing. Popular belief says that he was banished there for, for preaching 
But I have read, and just studying it out, I have read that there's no, uh, no evidence of, of such a thing, no evidence of a penal colony. Rather, the opposite is true. There's no penal colony, there's no history of it. Um, that's only comes from, some say, from only uh, so-called uh, church traditions and such. If he was there for uh, banishment, uh, how could the other seven churches that he's writing to escape punishment and only John did? It doesn't add up. It just doesn't make sense. John would have been a, 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 a very, very old age if uh, um, at that time they, they figure, but yet he's told later on that he's going to go and preach some more. Uh, the year wasn't 92 AD. It wasn't under uh, uh, Domitian. The, the year was later in the very latter part of the 60s. And we'll look at that when we get down to chapter 17. I believe it gives us the, uh, some clues as to the date of the writing of this. Um, so we see that there, is it true there's no, no penal colonies there? There's no history of it? I couldn't find it. Maybe you can find it. But uh, with that, I just say, well, I don't think he was there because if John was persecuted for preaching the word of God, how come he's allowed to write the letter and send it out to all the churches and such and so on and so forth? And others all around were still... Um, living for Christ and preaching and such, but only John was. It doesn't make sense. I don't think he was there for, for uh, a, a, like a prison sentence. He went there to minister to the fishing villages and so on and so forth. That's what I believe. But you don't have to accept that. That's just my, uh, um, my take on it. You study it out, you check it out, see what you can find. The Isle of Patmos. He was there for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ. I think he was there to preach it. Nonetheless, we won't divide the church over that one. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Well, that would be a real good thing when you, on the Lord's day to be in the spirit. We're supposed to be actually in the spirit every day, though, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 18, tells us a little bit about uh, being in the spirit. Let me find this verse for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. You see, with a person that's drunk is under the control of that. And it's a funny thing that alcohol is called spirit, isn't it? Spirits. But here it says that be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Okay, and he goes on to say some things that, that we, you know, come out from that should do, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and such. Um, to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, to be in that place. How do you get there? You're walking with the Lord. You're reading your Bible and praying, and, just, and you get in a place like a quiet place and where nobody can bother you and you're not bothered by uh, the busyness of your life or the clock or anything else. Find that time, and you'll find that you'll just be just lifted up. It'll be an exciting and wonderful time to spend with the Lord, and you should be doing that. We should be doing that all the time not just on Sunday. He says the Lord's Day, that's the first day of the week, which we call Sunday. It's a special day. It's not a day for everything else. It's not another Saturday. It's a day for worshiping the Lord. The early church gathered together on the first day of the week. That's our Sunday. Saturday was the Sabbath before. He's the day Jesus rose from the dead on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. But let's have a look at the rest of the verse. And I heard behind me a great voice as, as, as of a trumpet. Now some say it was, it was a trumpet. No, it wasn't a trumpet. It was as a trumpet, okay? It means it was loud like a trumpet. You know how loud that could be if somebody's blowing that in your ear? That's pretty loud. And John hears a voice. It is loud like that. Perhaps it had that kind of a tone. I don't know, but it was a loud thing because it was a great voice. We use the word mega. That's what that, that word means right there. Loud as a trumpet. And this voice says saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Now, he just said that back in verse 8, didn't he? Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. He's the beginning of all things. He's the last word of all things. This is God Almighty, isn't it? This is the Lord. This is God, this great voice. And he gives instructions to John. Okay, This is the Lord Jesus. It told us earlier that... that uh, that this was going to come from Jesus to then it go to angels and such, then go to John. But here he is, here's the Alpha and the Omega, giving this instruction. And he's telling John, 
what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay? Now let's just stop and think about that just for a moment. He gives John this instruction. Write down these things that you see, John. We see something about our Lord, something about God here, something about Jesus. We see something about him. Now, John was going to be shown uh, visions, or was it a glimpse into the future, or whatever it was. And the Bible talks about visions and such and that. But the things which he's going to see, he's going to write down the explanation. Now, I don't know about you, but unless John was a very fast writer, um, how, how would you write down all these things? I think the Lord, he, our God is so patient and so loving and kind and understanding. And John's writing these things down, putting it down, putting it down. And everything has to wait until John's ready, until he's caught up. That's our God. He's just so patient and just so understanding. That's our Lord. You got something that you need to have straightened out, take it to him. He is so understanding and patient. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 68, pour out your hearts unto him. Okay. But here we see John's instruction. Write down this whole book of Revelation. You write it down. Write it down, John. And send it to the seven churches of Asia. Okay. Now we're going to look at those. That's the next section coming up, beginning in chapter 2. But what we have here is John... Uh, John wants to turn now and see the voice that spoke, spoke with him. Um, verse 12, verse 11, and it, it said, name the seven churches. We'll get to those later, the seven churches there. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now these were more than likely the candlesticks like... Uh, the ones you would have found in the tabernacle in the wilderness or the temple, they would be, uh, um, be on a stand, would come up, and it would have, the arms would go out like this, and there would be seven of them, and there would be little, uh, little reservoirs in top for the oil, olive oil, and then a wick coming out, and that's what the lamp would have been like at that time. That was the, the lamp described here. That's the biblical one, the one from the tabernacle and such. So there were seven of those things all around there. We don't know if it was a semicircle or whatever, but the, you picture it in your mind. Use your sanctified imagination. John turns and he sees seven of these golden candlesticks. And in the midst, in the middle of them, in the middle of these candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. Well, who's that? Well, that's the Lord Jesus. You see, John was the apostle that was called... Uh, the, uh, the one whom the Lord Jesus loved. He's the one that, that's at the, at the supper table that he leaned upon Jesus' breast. They were very close. And he, he was the one that when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus says to John, Behold thy mother, speaking of his own mother, the Lord Jesus' mother Mary, and John, you're to take her and look after her. And John, John knew what Jesus looked like. He knew who this was. It was no mistaking There'd be no mistaking Jesus when we see him, but uh, John, had, there was no mistaking him at all. Now, the Son of Man, some say, well, what does that mean? Oh, sometimes they will, that refers to his humanity. Well, it's a little more than that. I'm going to give you another verse to look up and some study. It's kind of like you're in school getting all kinds of homework, eh? Yeah, but this is good homework. This is good for us. Did you know that when you get saved, you're, you're placed into God's classroom? And it's lifelong. You never get out. You'll know, you know, always learn. And uh, it's just a wonderful blessing. I'm going to turn to, uh, you don't have to turn there just for time's sake. Just let me read it. But you can be like, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Now Daniel has a vision of uh, God's kingdom and some things. Okay, all kinds of visions he had and was given to him. But this particular one, Daniel says in chapter 7, Verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. He came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Who's that? 
That's the Messiah. That's the Christ. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Lord himself. So when you see in the Bible, Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man. He's referring back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 there to describe uh, the description that's there of himself. He's the one that should come. Standing before the Pharisees, he calls himself the Son of Man. And they didn't get it. Well, if they got it or not, they certainly weren't letting on, were they? I don't think they got much. He's the Son of Man. So when you read the Son of Man, it's uh, showing it's that one that would come. The Lord himself, the Christ, the Christos, the Messiah. There he is. God manifest in the flesh. John turns and he sees one like unto the Son of Man. Where are we? Verse uh, 13. I'm sorry. 13. <laughs> and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Okay, right down, completely covered up, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle, this big band or this big belt across his chest. Okay, a golden kind of a belt or a sash or whatever, uh, across his chest. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Reminds me of that verse that talks about the Ancient of Days. We just read that in Daniel 7. As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. It just help make, makes us uh, think of uh, just that piercing gaze, the one that sees everything, you know, the seven spirits before God walking to and fro in the earth, seeing everything, seeing everything. That's our Lord, that's Jesus himself, and the description of him here. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Verse 15. His feet like unto fine brass. Now brass in the Bible, uh, different metals mean different things too, you know. Uh, Egypt was called uh, uh, the iron furnace. Uh, brass was a, a, is a, um, brass and bronze depends how much alloys are in it, tin and stuff, but uh, very hard metal and endures the, the, the flame and such. The altar was made out of brass, wasn't it? It has to do with uh, uh, judgment as well. It has the, just that idea of judgment and such. And the Lord Jesus, he walks in judgment, his feet in judgment, as it were, if we could put it that way. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. If you've stood near... A, uh, a waterfall, for instance. I don't know if many of you have been to Niagara Falls. And you get close to that, and it's quite a roar comes from that. And it's quite a, quite a sound, quite a thing. It has a, uh, an awesomeness to it, something that just a, a reverent thing is just the power of the water. And here we have the same idea with the voice of God, the voice of Christ, as the sound of of many waters, just that that power and such. And there he is. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Okay, he had seven stars in his right hand. And out of his mouth went a, a sharp two-edged sword. Now, did he actually have, or will he actually have a, a, a mouth hanging out of a sword hanging out of his mouth? You remember symbolism, okay? Um, the Bible is called the Word of God. It's called the sword of the Spirit, isn't it? Okay. The sword of the spirit and that sword will pierce even to the dividing of soul and spirit and of the joints and of the marrow and of the intents of the heart and such in Hebrews it tells us that so it's not actually that so we, when you see these things you don't take them literal some people say well this has got to be literal no it doesn't that's impossible that's just silly that's not what's being said here he is the word of God comes forth from his mouth and it is so powerful the Bible tells us that the worlds were framed by the word of God the word that God spoke, and there we have the stars and everything. Some people don't believe that. Sorry, I can't help you with that. That's what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He doesn't explain himself. He just states it. It's faith that accepts it. And by faith, it has to be and must be accepted. Okay, That's what it is. There's no other explanation for it. Nothing else makes sense anyways. 
So we see his right hand, seven stars. He goes on to explain that later. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance, the look of his face and such, was as the sun shines in his strength. So it's just beaming bright, just beaming bright. And then an amazing thing is the description. Now, the Lord often will gives, gives us things in uh, uh, the way we can understand. He says, Jesus says, I am the door. Is he really a, like a door that swings on hinges? No, of course not. But it's to help us to understand the thing a little better. A door is the entrance way or exit from somewhere, isn't it? He's the door into heaven, so he's the entrance to heaven, isn't he? We see that. We see these wonderful things about him, about the Lord Jesus. We see the, 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 the word of God that's powerful, the, the shining uh, uh, countenance. Verse 17, and when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as dead. He just folded up, and he's down on the ground. I heard a lady say one time, she said when, you know, when she gets to see the Lord, she's just going to punch him in the nose. I know you're not, ma'am. <laughs> you're going to probably just fall down and crumple. Yeah. The Bible tells us in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, that every knee shall bow unto Jesus Christ every knee, all things that are in heaven, upon the earth, and under the earth. Well, what do you suppose is under the earth? That's a whole other study, but check it out. The Bible tells us, in even in, I think, Psalm 55, that hell is beneath. That's where the spirits of the unsaved are kept. But everybody's going to be brought up, and everybody will bow. Best to bow now while you can, uh, as Jesus, as your Savior. You don't want to be there when he's your judge. You're going to pay for your sins yourself. But not meaning to be overly harsh or anything, but that's the reality of it, folks. You don't get to heaven by being a good person and doing good works and such. It's not by your baptism. It's not by going to church. It's by accepting Christ as Savior. The Father says, I sent my Son to the cross to pay for your sins. He died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried in the tomb, rose from the dead on the third day. It's done. It's wrapped up with a bow on it, and it's yours if you want it. Please, he says, God is not willing that any should perish, but you must, you must believe. You must accept Christ. You must receive him as your Savior. Acknowledge your sins before God and take Christ as your Savior. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And this is a wonderful thing. Look at this, what comes next here. And he laid his right hand upon me. Now, just a minute now. You're having troubles? You're having difficulties with life and problems and such, and God seems so far away? He is not. The Apostle Paul was in Mamertine Dungeon. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. Those words mean that he stood, means to be at my elbow. He's right there, right there. John fell at, his, uh, at, his, at the Lord's feet as dead. He just crumpled there and he saw him. And Jesus laid his hand upon him. How close would Jesus have to have been to John for Jesus to lay his hand on him? He wasn't across the room. He wasn't far away. He was right there. He's right there. He just, there he is, right there. Peter, walking on water, steps out of the boat. He's walking on the water. The Lord bid me to come out there, and he walks on the water. Then he gets looking around, and the water's the storm and everything. He starts to sink. Lord, save me. He calls out to the Lord. And the Bible says that Jesus put stretched forth his hand and laid his hand upon him. How close was Jesus to, to Peter? He's right there in the time of trouble. John's time of trouble, there he is. You got troubles? Turn to Jesus, look to him. He's right there. He's there for you. He's our Savior, he's our Lord, he's our God, he's our Master. Turn to the Lord, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing is ours to know God, to be known of God. And look at this, and John falls down in this time. He fell down because of fear. He was afraid. It's too bad more people weren't afraid of God today in the sense that the fear of God would be upon them. You hear people cussing and cursing sometimes. They use Jesus Christ's name as a curse word. They're just piling up those sins. Piling. You're going to answer for that someday, bud. You're going to answer for it. There should be a real healthy fear of God. He doesn't want us to fear. He wants us to love him as he loves us. 
I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. Isn't that a wonderful thing? The Lord wants you not to fear, not to be afraid. The Bible says that's the devil's work. Okay? Even the fear of death, Hebrews chapter 2, the devil holds that over people. Fear, fear. That's not God's work. Not God's work. It's, I am the first and the last. Verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead. In case anybody wondered who this was, I am he that, that he's alive and he was dead and alive forevermore. Well, who's that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Amen. It be so. And have the keys of hell and of death. The Lord has that power. He has that, well, that control, I guess you could say, that control over things, the first and the last. This is the Lord himself, um, the power of life and death. I think one preacher said one time that he didn't, just didn't fear anything, didn't fear death. He says, when it was my turn to go, he, the Lord Jesus put the key in that lock and opened that door, and I would just go and be in his presence. What a way to look at it, eh? Yeah. So <clears throat> the Lord says to John, says, don't be afraid, John. I'm alive. I'm here with you. I have the keys of hell and death. I've got the power over everything. But what I want you to do, John, and just like as if the, the Lord says to you and me, we've got something for us to do, yeah? You live for Jesus. Tell others about him. Give them the opportunity to be saved. Get the gospel out to them. Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen. This is a key verse right here, verse 19. This is one of the not... You can't say one's more important than another, but this is very important because here it gives you the key to revelation, okay, in what's taking place. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Three things there, past, present, and future. We talked about that at the beginning in their introduction. Some of the things are in the past, some of the present, and some will be the future. We've looked at some of the past things and the present, present things. He's going through this, uh, this bit uh, about the Lord Jesus here. And then we're going to go into the present, present from that time in chapter 2. And then the future will be uh, uh, the things that will come. That stuff. When people talk about the book of Revelation and all the terrible things that's going to happen, that's future stuff yet. Let's carry on here and finish it up to the end of the chapter. Okay, now he explains. Remember he said, John said he turned and he saw that one like the Son of Man, there's seven stars in his right hand. The right hand in the Bible, that's the place of power and authority and privilege. And he's got in his hand these seven stars. The Lord Jesus had seven stars. And he tells us what that is in verse, uh, um, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. Do angels get letters sent to them? Do you think John was writing a, a letter to an angel and was going to go up to heaven or whatever? No, 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 that's not it. But if we look at the word angel and we look at the definition of that word, uh, it has the idea of being a messenger. Angels, you know, there's seraphims and cherubims and the, uh, the beasts around the throne, the creatures, and there's angels who are messengers. They would stand before God. And there's just a, uh, you can't count the number of them, and God would want something done, and an angel would go up from the throne of God uh, down to help us or whatever needed to be done. Okay. Psalm, uh, I think it's 20. 22, in and around there, talks about uh, send thee help from the throne, throne room or something like that. And God would send out an angel, a messenger, they're messengers. So who would be a messenger to the church? It's not an angel. He's referring to the pastors of the church. The preacher, the pastor. The pastor, the elder, the bishop, that's the same uh, individual, uh, different descriptions of that same office. Okay, The one who's responsible responsible for uh, the church and the people and such. Some people say, well, I, nobody rules over me or anything. Nobody tells me what to do. Well, maybe so, but just think on this verse just for a moment. In, <clears throat> excuse me, 
In uh, Hebrews chapter 13, it says in verse 7, Remember that them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of the conversation. Now, I know that sometimes pastors and churches rule over God's people with a heart, uh, like a, an iron fist, and that's wrong. They should be run out. Not to rule over the people like that. Uh, not to lord it over them, but to guide. But there is something about the pastor. He's the messenger. God, he's the one that stands in the pulpit and brings messages from the word of God for the people. Look at this. Verse 17, Hebrews chapter 13. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Some people don't like to hear those words but that's just too bad. As we said at the beginning this is the word of God we're talking about. This is not the uh, uh, this Bible isn't about man's opinions mine or yours or anybody else's. This is about what God says. Okay, He says that so we see that the, uh, um, the messengers of the churches, now when we get down to the seven churches, beginning in chapter 2, it says, unto the angel of the church of, say, Ephesus. The Lord is speaking to the pastor. He's directly responsible for the good and the bad that happens there. And going to be going to have to answer for it. And then the application that goes out to every one of us, every person in the church, okay? And when you look at these church things here, it's not just about the pastor, it's not, but he's the one that's going to take that thing back then. He would take that thing and that letter and take it to the church and, and they would look at that and discuss that and see the things that were wrong and the things that were right and such. The seven stars, the angels of the church, and held in his hand. Now being a pastor, I've been a pastor for 25 years now, I think it is. Something like that. And there's a lot of good times. There's some bad times. Treat the man with respect, and he should surely be treating you with respect, and be at peace among yourselves, Hebrews 13 again, okay? But anyways, that's who it is. That's what he's talking about there. What a privileged position, what a wonderful position. But you know, whatever happens for good in the church, that like we have uh, uh, some missionaries we support. We're not a very big church. We, we support a number of missionaries all around the world. What a privilege it is. And every person here has the, uh, the privilege of, of supporting those ministries. So they have a hand in those ministries. Church isn't about the pastor. It's not about the programs that we have. It's about worshiping Jesus Christ. It's about being there in the assembly. In fact, the word church means assembly. It doesn't mean building. It's not about the building at all. You can meet in a barn. It doesn't matter. It's the assembly of God's people, those who have been called out of the world, called out to praise and worship Jesus Christ. That's the church, the people right there. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now, the Bible tells us, again, another verse for us here, um, in, in regards to the uh, church and congregating and gathering together, the Lord left us uh, some uh, words here in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, we've been told here with this virus thing going around that we're not allowed to gather together in big groups and all this stuff and God says don't you forsake the assembling yourselves together boy oh boy what are we supposed to do he says and so much the more as you see the day approaching what day is that the day of Christ coming okay he says you need to get yourselves and we say I'm going to church we know what we mean when we say that I'm going to church get yourselves into church be part of an assembly somewhere, one, a church somewhere that teaches the Bible, that uses the Bible. And if they're not teaching from the Bible, don't bother with them. Get and find one and get yourself to be part of it. That's what he says. And don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I want to finish up this, uh, this particular video with uh, um, just three things here. We see the Lord Jesus Christ walking in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And he says those seven candlesticks 
are the churches, these seven churches he's going to write to. What's a candlestick for, for back then? We don't use them today, but what, what was it for? For light. The church is light. Your church, the one you support, the one you attend, the one you pray for, and all that is to be light. We are a light in the community, a light for Jesus, to show people the way, to tell them the way. But we see three, three things about the Lord Jesus Christ when we uh, consider these things. Um, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and He ever lives to make intercession for the, un, uh, for the saved. That's a wonderful and comforting thing to know that right now, Jesus Christ is praying for you if you're a Christian. Praying for me. I like that. I need lots of prayer. You probably do too. But the Lord Jesus prayed. Not something. Intercession is one of his ministries. In the ministry of the cross. We know that. All, all those things. But right now, he's in heaven. He's not just sitting there putting his feet up. He's praying for us. John 17. Read it. Check it out. Intercession. And the second one, Intervention. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that we have the Spirit of Christ within us. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is of Christ. He's right within us. Intervention. He's there to intervene, to help us bring this old nature under control, keep us on the right path. But here we see him in Revelation doing something else. There's a third thing he's doing. Inspection. Walking among the churches. Now Jesus Christ is the, the head of the church. He's what we're, why we gather together. I'm not the head of the church. You're not the head of the church. Nobody else is. It's Jesus Christ. It's his. And you know, when we gather together in the assembly, he's there. He says where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. And he's inspecting the churches. They don't get away with anything. You're going to reap what you sow. But he inspects He's investigating. So these three things, intercession, intervention, and inspection of the church as well. The intercession, we could say, he brings comfort for us. It's a comforting thing to know that he prays for us. And intervention, the Spirit of Christ, there's a cleansing there. That's that sanctification, that daily sanctification, doing the right things and leading us and such. But this inspection one is correction. And people don't think of that too often. They don't think of the correction aspect of the ministries of Christ. And he corrects the church. Next time, Lord willing, we'll have a look at, uh, beginning with chapter 2 and chapter 3, looking at the actual letters to those churches and see some things that might fit ourselves and our churches and so on and so forth, what was going on back then, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for your time. You've got a lot of verses to look up and such. We'll have a go at it, uh, and uh, shortly we'll jump back into this. But right now, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace upon us. We pray, Lord, that these studies would help. And we know, Lord, we're just going through like a freight train, but, Lord, there's still a lot of good things here. Help us, Lord, to be studying your word, to looking up things and comparing Scripture with Scripture. Lord, we just ask that you just bless everyone that reads and hears and keeps these things that are written therein. For the time is at hand. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for having a look. Lord bless you. Bye now.